found myself back in Pittsburgh. I ran into Tom. Tom said, Jim, I've got this great role for you. George Romero, who did Night of the Living Dead, is uh, making another movie. Where we are is at the Harold Brown Memorial Airfield, and uh, a lot of key things happened here. If I were a zombie coming out of the tree line back here, coming under an airplane wing, I'm obscured by a few boxes that are between me and the helicopter and lunch. So as I happen to make my way up, you don't know that you're gonna get the top of your head taken off with the helicopter. Uh, I don't know how many people would have immediately said yes to that. I was working at an ad agency in downtown Pittsburgh, and I had gone out to lunch. When I came back, Tom Savini was there at my office. He had come to show me his famous monsters collection because he had just picked up my collector's guide. So that's how we got together. From the collector's guide, I met another fellow. He was publishing a magazine called Questar. We became partners with the third issue. We also opened offices on the first floor at 247 Fort Pitt Boulevard. And that's how we got to know George and Mike Gornick and Vince Servinsky because they were up on five. And that's when George was just starting pre-production on Dawn. I just read the newspaper and found out about it that way. And I thought, wow, I'd really like to work on this film. It was just like, I've been kind of waiting, you know, you hear about George Romero, Night of the Living Dead, and you heard about it for a long time. Now I'm an adult, been to film school. I'd really love to work with this guy. Put together a resume. I took a trolley into town, took an elevator up to the offices and walked in and there was a guy walking toward me. And I handed him a resume and I said, hey, would you please give this resume to George? And he said, hey man, I'm George. I'm like, oh. I had heard of George Romero before and uh, I had seen Night of the Living Dead uh, in college. I didn't know a lot about George Romero at the time, but um, Night of the Living Dead, I did know. A lot of the folks in Dawn of the Dead uh, were from the local area, but a number of them I've worked with in theater. I first did a, a play with Clayton Hill and Sharon. I was a graduate student at the University of Pittsburgh at the time in theater. And uh, there must have been like a, a note on the wall or somebody I knew. We found out from the Lees brothers, Lenny and uh, Mickey Lees, that George was casting uh, for another movie. Tom Savini and I had been in college together at Point Park. We were uh, both uh, in, interested in theater, but we weren't part of the school's theater program. In Point Park, for those who don't know, is a university in downtown Pittsburgh. And so we formed our own theater company in, in the college outside of the Pittsburgh Playhouse. I was in college and I was uh, doing some theater as well, but I happened to see a sign they were looking for extras in a movie to be filmed in the area. So I called the number on there and it wouldn't go through. It just kept, it was a disconnected number. So I thought, I'm gonna try something. And I rearranged the numbers, and sure enough, it went through, and it was John Amplis, actually, who was doing casting. Primarily, I think I start, I was uh, asked to help with casting and did some casting work on it. I had a friendship already with David Emge, and I was able to get him involved, and people like Randy Kovitz. You got any cigarettes? And hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of zombies. <laughs> That was easy. That's a phone call. It was like, hey, man, you, you know, we're going to need a bunch of zombies. You know, you guys want to come out, you know, and uh, of course. Chris, bless her heart, called me and said, oh, there's this part. We're going to shoot it. You should come in. You could do it. And, you know, I had been in one other movie, which is a movie called Stay Hungry that Bob Rafelson directed. And I had a small part in that and it, it really enjoyed doing that. And so, I, of course, I came in, you know, chance to be in a movie. I hand wrote a resume, got a couple snapshots, and I went down, I met Clayton and Sharon there. Um, so George looked, you know, he smiled, you know, nice guy that he is. Uh, 
He says, okay, I'll be in touch with you. So I didn't hear anything for, I guess it was a good two months. And I was like, well, I guess I'm out. I was at the School of Visual Arts and I proposed a series of teaching films about independent filmmaking. So I was looking for a film to shoot on and then I hear that George is shooting Dawn and that Richard Rubenstein is producing. I was friends socially with Richard. So I called and I said, can I uh, come up there with a couple of teachers or students and, you know, do a making of? He said, yes, that's, you know, that's, that's interesting promotional value. I said, great. So I met George maybe for the first time really on the set. I started out as a camera grip. I was there from day one. Through all the pre-production, all of production, until we basically put away the final piece of equipment. If you're smart on a movie, you shoot all your exteriors first, you know? So that's what happened. I got a call from Christine. She said, we need you down in Pittsburgh. So I said, all right. I don't remember where the tenement house was. It was nowhere near the mall. We were shooting in the projects, which I think was actually on top of the office building downtown. Come on, Martinez. It was 20 below zero. And when I came in, George smiled and he said, give Joe Shelby the chrome plated gun and set him up for the squibs. So I became Martinez. I start all the action in the movie. I come out the rooftop and I shoot a SWAT guy between the eyes. Rod Tucker, I think his name was. I dove across the roof. I still got some asphalt in my elbows. They needed somebody up on the roof. And so George said to Tom, just have John do it. I was put in uh, a bad wig, a bandana, bad mustache and goatee, and thrown up on the roof. Don't go out there! To this day, I apologize to every single Latino or, or Hispanic that uh, uh, sees me in that movie. <laughs> George said, do you mind getting squibbed? I said, no. Come over and get me a hug. I said, do you need anything else? He goes, yeah, you could be there every day if you want. Later on, I was assistant makeup to Tom Savini. So once that was over, then we all moved into the mall and shot all that stuff. We had less than a million dollars to work with. And we had a mall that we couldn't even enter until the mall closed. So we worked all night long. Although basically the set was the mall, so that was given, but we still had to coordinate with the owner, you know, with the different storefronts and all that kind of stuff. When I came on Dawn, I came a week into it. They did a first week of a lot of silent stuff at the mall. So when I came in, I came in, I think, straight from the airport. I went out to that set. I was, oh my God, all these people here. So, because it seemed so big, because Martin was like five people and he had all these extras and all this crew. It seemed like I was really working on a big film. I had one of the first filmmaking classes in this area. It was at North Hills High School. Between classes, the English teacher came over and said, hey, did you hear they're filming? the sequel to Night of the Living Dead over at Monroeville Mall, and they're looking for extras. I went home and I told my brother about it, and he said, we should go. A friend of mine said, hey, you want to go down to the mall? They're filming some kind of horror movie or something. So I said, sure, let's go down. I came in with Tom Savini. We were pals at Carnegie Mellon College. Uh, he just said, oh, there's a big film is coming up. We're going to start shooting. You want to come and be my special effects makeup assistant? She said it was a zombie film. So lots of death, lots of action. People lined up for miles to be a zombie. It's, it's a mall and movies. And who, who does that in Pittsburgh? Back then, <laughs> nobody did. He wouldn't have done this at all if I wouldn't, it wasn't his thing. He was an athlete. So it was, come on, this will be fun. They had us all stand in a line and a, a woman, a casting director, I assume, came by and she go, okay, you, 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 and you, and pulled us out and they wanted us to be zombies. Uh, I think 99% of the zombies were just, they said, show up. And, and so whatever you were wearing is, is what they filmed you in. I had been working on a spelunking rescue mission. That's mud splattered on my face and, you know, mud splattered all over my clothes. George was nearby and he just looked and chuckled and said, that's perfect. 
I don't know how much people got, but I got a dollar. I signed my name on a form. I had everybody sign a, a release form and gave us each a dollar which I burned through pretty quick that night. <laughs> Every time we showed up, we got a dollar just for walking in the door, and they just kind of stand there and wave the dollars, and here we go, here we go, here we go. I can remember saying, come on out. You may only get a dollar, but it'll be good cocktail conversation for the rest of your life. Then if you got called back, you would get $15. $15, woo. $15 for the end scene. That was the one to get punched in the mouth with Ken and we did that several times, but it was fun. And he's a big guy, and his big fist was coming at my face. So that was kind of cool. I didn't really, in the beginning, tell everybody I was making this movie because here I am, this thespian, you know, doing dramatic roles in Shakespeare. And I'm like, well, I'm, you know, like the zombie. And I'm like, ah. People would eat old bones and. <laughs> They jumped right into the carnage. They had no problem whatsoever. The mall had like a big conference room, and that's where they set up, and they had all these big card tables set up. We had an assembly line. People would come in, put the makeup on, here's a prop. <laughs> it was just lined up. Tom Savini was orchestrating people. You go here, you go there, and he had a lot of assistants. Maybe, let's say, 10, 14 people that were putting makeup on. We had tables, and there were hundreds of people in line, and they would go along, and we had people who would do the base makeup. You would sit in a chair, you'd put your head back, and they'd have a little sponge and all over your face and a little bit of darkness under your eyes. To be honest, I was a little insulted because they didn't think I needed any makeup <laughs> to, to look like a dead person. So I don't, I don't really recall them putting any makeup on me because I'm obviously really light complexion, so I kind of fit the, could have been the other reason why they picked me up. This guy looks dead already. If they needed a lot of people right away, they were pretty quick. You put the gray up, darken their eyes, we're done. I remember John Amplis was one of the makeup guys and Jeannie Jeffries. After a while, I said to Jeannie, I can do this. Do you need help? She said, that would be great. I would do some blood on people, a little bit, not like Tom's. And then several people we would bring onto another table and they would do a little more. I must have had a stockpile of appliances to just grab and throw on you. We made pans of random scabs, sort of stuff that we could glue onto people's faces like they were rotting corpses. They seemed to pick out certain individuals that they thought might have more recognition in the film. And with those individuals, ourselves included, there was definitely more attention. We brought the really interesting people in and we would do a really good for close-up stuff, teeth, really bleeding wounds, anything interesting, limbs missing, stuff like that. We would bring those people in. We could do 50 to 100 people a night that way. And then we had some very specific zombies that appeared. The nurse zombie who was on our crew, Sharon. Jeannie Jeffries, who's good friend. Because I was friends uh, with Tom and George and everybody, I got to be a special zombie. So, you know, I got sent over into the corner where they, uh, they made me up to do the, the uh, shoot where I would get popped in the forehead. The second time that I went, um, I was debating on whether to go because it was a school night and I was really tired. I was up since six in the morning. And I didn't feel like staying up all night, but I was at a party at some friends and I told them about this and they said, oh, we should all go. From my perspective, never having done any film work or anything like that, um, it seemed pretty scattered. They would film one thing and then they'd go and film another thing. They'd go buy a car and film something else. I was just concentrating on trying to get sound. Once again, it was fairly low budget. We had some wirelesses once in a while, but they really didn't work that well. They were just shooting things all out of order that when this was done, I had no clue how this would even piece together. We would go at nine o'clock at night and come home at six in the morning. Basically, it was just show up and they would tell us what to do where to go, who to see. For a dollar and a bag lunch, ready to go, stand around for 12, 14 hours just to be in a George Romero film. We came into the big room. There was a huge room there where the restrooms are now. 
lots of craft services. We would sit down, talk with people. It seemed like it was a very chill set. We were just told pretty much improvise. Whenever you have to do something, just look like you're dead. Blank stares. No expression. You can drool if you'd like, you know, those kinds of things that would make you look like a zombie. And we had to kind of imagine because now zombies are a big deal. Back then, we didn't even barely know what a zombie was. Certain ones we needed during the week, and then certain ones, you know, kept repeating throughout the show. So we needed them to come back, you know, semi regularly. And the bigger days, of course, would be on the weekend, like Friday night, Saturday night. A lot of people were students or professionals. Everybody was in their own little groups, their own little cliques. People would come at 2 o'clock in the morning after they were drinking. They loved every second of it. Everybody stayed in that room, and then I would go running back saying, We need 50 zombies. Who wants to die today? Raise your hand. We're going to need 20 people uh, in like one hour, and, and two people are going to get shot. Easy. John's brother was also in it, but something happened and he didn't, he couldn't do it or something. So Jim said, I'll do it, I'll, I'll die today. And so Savini would create the shots. I mean, that's how it worked every night. I carried a sleeping bag around. I would sleep wherever I could in the mall until they woke me up. Hey, you got to make up so-and-so. It's time for that effect. Whenever I film my Super 8 home movie, I was filming but whenever I was getting ready or I was in a scene, my brother would be filming. So there's a scene of George Romero talking to me, going like this with his hands. He always talked with his hands, telling me what to do and how to walk and what to do. But for the life of me, I have no clue what he said to me. Everything just went in one ear out the other. The toughest part was being there all night. Most of the shooting was at night. So there was a lot of nights that I didn't get any sleep. Because we probably wouldn't start shooting until about midnight. And then we would cut in the morning before the mall opened. Even though we were exhausted, you know, because you're, you're working all these hours and I got no sleep at night. I would go home and I'd be so wound up, I couldn't sleep. And so I'd fall asleep like an hour before I had to go to work. But I knew I was working on something special. As the film evolved, it became much more organized and much more serious. And of course, by then, all of us that were together hanging out, uh, we started to bond and become friends. One friend that we met, she's actually British. Her husband was a Gulf Oil vice president. She brought her two children with her. They lived out in Sewickley. They were playing cards. They were socializing. They were just having fun being there. We spoke with the lady that has all the jewelry. She was very sweet. The gentleman that went into the water in his swim trunks, he was a lot of fun. People that were there were from every background. You know, that's what made it unique. All different walks of life, people that, uh, you know, just mostly local folks that came in and heard about it probably just like I did. It wasn't the kind of atmosphere where you would say, all these people want their 15 minutes of fame. They weren't necessarily actors, actresses who wanted to make a career of this. It was just a local, low budget film, something fun to do. So it was a different caliber of people, I think. It was a bunch of friends being together, having, having fun. You know, like instead of a party at somebody's house, we're at the mall doing this for a lark, just for something to do, something different. And that seems to be what a lot of the other people were doing there. The people that came out, they loved doing it. Everybody was energetic and had fun. So from the helipad here, we're going to walk into the little administration building where not only were scenes filmed, but it was sort of the makeup headquarters. That's where Jeannie Brown, Tom Savini, and everyone were making sure the zombies were up to snuff. This is where a lot of makeup took place. On this area was a vending machine. And you may remember the scene in which Ken Frey comes up and... So he's just starting to relax. 
right in about this area. I was first though. You were. I was the first one that. I probably pushed you. Probably. Tom's, Tom's the baby. Mean. He's our uncle. We woke up for school, and our mother said that we're not going to school, and she wouldn't tell us where we were going until we got her. Now, there were supposed to be three of us, my older sister Donna, but she, when she get the flu or something? She yet? was sick, yeah. Yeah, she laid in there and moved all day sick. He talks to me here. It was not that in. easy. He I threw me in. into lights. I cried. I bit him for real. I really bit hard. He screamed and they cut. I remember not wanting to bite him. <laughs> I didn't want to bite anybody, but I was still scared. Even though we were zombies, I was afraid of the zombies. And when I cried, Tom would be like, you're okay, just go ahead, you're fine, you're fine. Yeah. Like, just to shut us up real quick. <laughs> so we could keep going and keep going. It took all day. I feel like it was like 12 hours. We got was, here, it was dark out, we left, it was dark out. It was way longer than 12 hours. I remember us running around, and uh, George said, put the twins in the closet. Uh, <laughs> Because we were See, bothering them. Right, and then in the middle of the shoes, someone shut the twins up. <laughs> I remember just Uncle Tom giving us directions. Oh my gosh. Have him for an uncle. I remember Ooh. he would like shop in the middle of the night and scare shit of us in the bedroom. I remember coming down the stairs one time. My mom called me. She goes, Come here, and I'm walking over. And Dark Vader came out from behind her fridge. <laughs> uh, that is new latex thing. And he turned me into a gorilla. Playing of the Apes. Yeah. It started with me. Yeah, but you wouldn't go for it. No, because I couldn't. I was very afraid of the latex over my face and right. not breathing. So he so I checked blew those latex on my face and all moved the eyes there. Oh, I, and uh, he forgot the solvent or the compound ever to get it off. So I was stuck with this damn thing all night long. And my <laughs> mom sent me to the store and walked around like a freaking ape all through the neighborhood. <laughs> There's, uh, there's three of us. When George wrote that sequence, I thought, oh my God, how? and then I said, where are we gonna find these people? The bikers were actual bikers. Um, Nick Mistandria, who was my key grip, um, his sister was very friendly um, with uh, a number of, of bikers, who were gentlemen bikers, but nonetheless, uh, who had then in turn advanced to the notion to other bikers. There was some Pittsburgh bike group. The Pagans. They hired the Pagans to play the bike gang. My ex-husband used to ride with the Pagans. This was the days of Hell's Angels and all the movies and everything. And I rode with them upon occasion. And people would throw garbage at you. We had bricks thrown at us. We had people try to run us off the road. It was a nightmare to ride, but if we dressed in our colors, and uh, you know, had the sunglasses on and the, the bandana, I brought my bandana with me just for fun. And if we'd be, be dressed like we were badasses, everybody would sit at the light like this. They put the word out that they needed people that looked like bikers who could take direction. I had friends who were filmmakers and I had worked on uh, films for Mr. Rogers' Neighborhood which is where I met George Romero. The picture frame on Mr. Rogers' Neighborhood would show films about how things were made, how crayons were made, how bread was made. And another guy and myself went to New Jersey to shoot a light bulb factory. And the cameraman was George Romero. And that's how I met George. And any time I had a chance to work on any kind of film project, I took it. I was an actor, and uh, I was a dancer and a singer, and I uh, did a lot of plays and things like that, and um, I had an agent at the time, and the agent said to me, would you be interested in doing a movie? I'm like, sure, I don't care. And he said, uh, well, I'm going to send you on the interview. I want you to write down everything you know how to do. I said, okay. So I did. And one of the things I knew how to do was ride a motorcycle. Yeah, I rode some when I was in college, but then... You know, every time I fell off, I said, I don't know if I'm going to do this again. And they said, do you ride or do you really know how to ride? I said, ride with the big dogs. They said, really? I said, yeah, I'm a good ride. I'm a good driver. I can ride. So um, they said, well, OK, you're in. They said, well, you're going to ride a motorcycle through the mall, trash a store, throw a hand grenade, and we'll pay you $25. I was like, fuck yeah. You know, it was like, I'll pay you $25 to let me do that.
When I came, I, I had a Honda. I had a Harley, a big old, you know, Harley 74 with a tank shift, uh, suicide clutch. And I said, I'm not taking that. I'm going to be riding around the mall. I want to ride a small bike. So I took my Honda and had them throw it up in the back of the truck and it was all strapped in and everything. And I pulled in and I went in, I saw all the bikers and I thought, okay, they're either going to kill me or they're going to respect me. So I walked in and I said, hey, I'm not bringing my Harley to this, you know, and they're all on Harley. I said, I'm bringing my junk to here. So they came over and picked it up like it was just like a little piece of toy and they put it down and I moved my truck and I thought, okay, so I kick-started it. Hey, at least the kick started, no wimp start. So I said, okay, got to show off a little bit so they respect me. So I took it out in the back in the parking lot and I rode it around. I laid it down so far. I was actually shooting sparks. It's a cheesy trick, but <laughs> it looks real good. <laughs> so, and then I came around and stopped and I popped, revved it up, popped a wheelie and rode it pretty much most of the way across the parking lot. And they were standing there and I did not stop. I brought it down, jumped the curb and went into the mall and they just parted. Whoa, chicken ride, man, chicken ride. I'm like, I'm not here to play games, <laughs> you know? So that was kind of it. I didn't even know if I knew there were a real motorcycle gang at that time. They were nice, but they were scary. It was like, it's like having a nice rattlesnake, you know? You can play with it, but if it decides to bite you, you're in trouble. It was a very crazy atmosphere, just the bikers everywhere. All the marijuana smoke, it was so thick that I was getting a secondhand high just being there. Every night the guns would disappear. And every night they'd have a long talk with them, and every night they'd suddenly remember where they put them. Because we used real guns. So, you know, they'd say, oh, we're missing a shotgun. And the guy in charge of the bikers here, rah, 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 rah. And, you know, and the guys would go, oh, oh, I laid mine down over there uh, on that, in that flower bed, and it's all covered with leaves and stuff. <laughs> I'm thinking, yeah. Pagans were, a lot of them were madmen but a lot of them were nice guys. Um, and the uh, nice guys kept the madman in line. Castle and I threw costumes on just to be in the movie. I was blades, he was sledge, because he had a sledgehammer and I had machetes and swords, you know, so. And had you done a lot of motorbike riding at this point? Nope, some, very little. I owned a bike. Um, yeah, Tasso, Tasso barred it one day. And uh, I don't know, half an hour later, this jogger came by and said, hey, your friend is lying up on the road. I thought, yeah, sure, how long have you known Tasso? I'm sure he put you up to it. No, 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 I think he's hurt. So I drove his car up there. My bike was in a tree and he had a broken leg. He broke his leg against the tree coming around a curve. So um, I picked him up, put him in the car and I was gonna be driving him to the hospital. He said, no, 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 take me to my apartment so I can lay at the bottom of the steps and sue the landlord, telling him I broke my leg coming down the... I said, no, 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 you're going to the hospital. Looks like they've been surviving on the road all through this thing. Come on. At one point in time, they had us come down the back hill of the mall. Pat Booba, who was uh, a film editor, um, he played one of the bikers, and he and I were at the top of the road with all the bikes lined up. And I was on the back of this one bike. Pat was on the back of another one. And the two guys that were riding the bikes, they were scary looking. And this guy said to me, uh, what's your name? I said, uh, Nick. And, and they looked at Pat, they said, what's your name? He said, Pat. And they said, oh. And I said, this guy, what's your name? And the guy looked at me and he had a beer can thing with the plastic thing in his mouth. He turned around and looked at me and said, killer. <laughs> and I leaned over to Pat and I said, you're on the back of a bike being driven by a man named Killer. And he went, oh shit. We were revving, being obnoxious. It was about two o'clock in the morning. This poor little old couple came out and said, what are you doing? We're like, hey, we're making a film. Oh, you know, we're here. It's okay. We're legal. And in the film, it looks like we're just crawling down that hill. When we were coming down that hill, we were coming down 70 miles an hour. When the bikers come and blow up the entrance to the, the side entrance to the mall, um, Gary Zeller had um, 
an explosive there for that. Gary Zeller did like just mainly squibs because he had the license, you know, for explosive stuff like that. I was off to the side standing next to Tony Boo who was recording sound and I saw the Niagara and then when the explosion went off, that needle just went all the way to the end. And because the uh, place had, uh, you know, glass on three sides and a roof, you know, it blew out some of the glass. You know, it's like it's a bit more than like as I expected. So, yeah, stuff like that happened. You know, they opened the big entrance doors at one part of the mall where they opened the doors. There was no rehearsal. George had the cameras high up at the other end of the mall, and we just signaled, and these these bikers just drove into the mall. And, you know, circled around and the noise was deafening. When they came driving those motorcycles in the mall, you couldn't do that today, you know? They wouldn't let you do that today. But they weren't there, so we got away with all that stuff. We shot a lot with the motorcycles, you know, because we just had them come in and, you know, ride around. And we shot three cameras. I was one camera and then Mike was on the sidecar and then George was shooting as well. We got as much of that as possible and then broke it down to just specific people, you know, for the specific bits and everything. It was every kid's fantasy, you know, when you're growing up and you play army and you pretend you got shot, you know, well, when uh, the Ken Foray shoots me, you know, I got to go backwards off my feet, fire my gun in the air while I was dying, and, oh, man. It didn't take a lot of acting. All I had to do was act like I was 10 again. In the morning, I'd go home and take a shower and go to work on Mr. Rogers. I'd go home with blood on my hands, wash it off, and then go play with X the Owl, you know. <laughs> There was something about the energy, the way it was being done, and, 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 I, just, and I, I just knew it from the beginning. That's why when George says you want to be, you know, put us in it, I went around because I didn't know what was going to have me do to you know, be a motorcycle raider. So I went around and found the biggest hat I could find, which was that sombrero, <laughs> so, I, so I could see myself, you know, on the screen because I thought I'd just be scurrying around the mall. I, I didn't realize I'd have some close-ups. Of course, then everybody asked. Why'd you stop and get your blood pressure taken? Oh man, what the hell are you doing playing around? Someone's up there shooting. And there's two answers. One, George told me, and the other is I wanted more screen time. <laughs> that was the motivation. But yeah, it was a, and I figured his character is not the brightest in the world. Shooting off that machine gun and the mannequin, I grabbed myself because I thought, well, this guy's probably a little perverted, you know. So I grabbed the mannequin. The mall used to have a walking bridge. So we're sitting there bored and I'm looking at that bridge and I look at him, he goes, dare you to ride over it. I said, okay, <laughs> so I did. I got in trouble, <laughs> but I didn't care. The big bearded hairy guy, Butchie, was an artist. He's quite the painter. I talked to him a lot. I think he may have brought some of his paintings around. Larry, the good-looking guy who gets killed off the sidecar, that's me doing the stunt for him. We chatted briefly, but uh, I was too busy. There were no stuntmen, so besides doing the special effects, we did the stunts. They hadn't gotten their act together to hire any stunt guys. I, I can do that. Okay. So all the action sequences was me and Tom. The energy those guys had, you can't imagine. I dove over a bridge into the water. I was dragged by the car. I was hit by the car right down there, fell over the balcony, swung on a rope. Was shot right out here in the truck sequence several times. The one night they said, help the effects guy, and he's making a, a glass, uh, he's making a window out of sugar glass. So this guy gave me this big long form and a funnel and bunches of this stuff. Well, he didn't build it right so that as this liquid went into the form, it got thicker and thicker. And by, by the time they were ready for it, the window was over an inch thick. I don't know that anyone else really could tell how thick it was, but when Tom hit it with the bike, there was big pieces of sugar glass. And Savini almost broke his neck going through that glass, you know, because he said, who the hell made this window? And I thought, I'm not going to tell them it was me. <laughs> At the time, we were young, and so we felt like there was nothing we couldn't do. I didn't know I could fall off a thing, you know. I just, you know, you heard about it being done, so yeah, I could do that. I was like, oh, yeah, we can do that. Sure, we can do that. That attitude is what George loved. Oh, yeah, I can do that, you know. So we just went for it, and we got away with it. 
without being killed. I don't know how. They were crazy and they were daredevils. <laughs> Savini got, got hurt, you know, when he dove off the railing. Um, he missed the boxes. Yeah, I had cardboard boxes and mattresses down there. And I had rehearsed it in the school gym, just diving off a ladder onto pads until I was confident that I could dive face down and turn at the last minute for my back to hit. But the first time I did it, I missed all the pads and the boxes. My head did, but my feet went smashing into the floor, my heels. So I couldn't walk. I couldn't walk for like two weeks. I was doing the effects from a golf cart or a wheelchair with a cane. He's very resilient, very athletic. So, you know, he walked it off. He was fine. So when I finally healed, I did the stunt again, but this time more boxes and more mattresses and it worked fine. Okay, Mike? Good. Out of sight. Okay. Those guys did everything. I mean, they just, and everybody was like at their creative peak, you know, and having fun. Tasso and I, we created our characters and George wanted to see more and more of that. So we became featured players, even though it's not in the script. You know, we were just doing it. George letting us improvise. Okay. He gave all of us, I think, you know, permission to be creative in our own way. He allowed us to do what we knew we had to do. They didn't treat us like we were just extras. It was like we were just a big part of the, the movie. You were treated with respect and asked what your opinion was. And he'd ask you, you know, what do you think of that? Did you like that shot? I never knew how George managed it all without becoming a maniac because there was a lot going on. You know what? He was very organized. You know, he basically, he was a good leader. I mean, he'd take whatever the team was and just say, you do this, you do this, you do this, and everybody did it. George was saying, don't, don't become confused about what you're about to see. <laughs> saying, why is that? And they wheel out these trays of pies. I thought it was weird. There's this dun, 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 dun action. And then all of a sudden it's like, hey, we're throwing pies and we're squirting each other. My favorite part of the whole thing was the pie in the face. That was the one scene I was in most. The bikers had just gotten in and they were going through the mall. I got a pie in the face when they were coming across the bridge. Camera. It's not in the script. I had everyone in my crew read the screenplay so we knew what we were getting into. George, I think he did, I think he mistimed it and how long he thought the film was going to be. So he ended up shooting a lot of extra stuff with all that pie throwing. George uh, allowed things to happen. He kept a sense of humor about it. There were still ideas, you know, even when we're shooting. You know, well, is there another way to kill a zombie? And so Savini talked about, well, what if we do a screwdriver? I said, hey, we're bad guys, right? He said, yeah. I said, I should roll one of these zombies. This guy got a big pocket here. He said, good idea. If you had an idea, I mean, you don't use everybody's idea, but oh, that's a good one. So George knew a good idea and would, would let us do it. Said, flip the shot around, we're doing this. Rudy Ritchie shooting at one of them, and then I did a close up on my hand, pulling his wallet out. I was like, wow, George let me do that, you know? George would, uh, you know, there was stuff in the script, but George would come up with things. And, and in the mall in particular, he had very inventive ideas. He'd come up with ideas, well, what if we do this, you know? George could have kept shooting in the mall, you know, for, forever with all the different things he would see and come up with different ideas. And one time he gave me an Airflex camera and we weren't shooting that particular night yet. We were out at the mall. And he said, Lynn, just take the camera and just, it's like, it's like cuts to zombies. He said, like, they're, you know, they're moving around and they're doing all this. And so just grab some wild footage, whatever you think, just, it doesn't matter. I'm like, really? Yeah, sure. And I shot for about, I don't know, 15, 20 minutes. George played a zombie Santa Claus. And he came running across the mall during when the bikers were coming in and they decided not to use it. They do not prey on each other. That's the difference. The people that played the zombies, sometimes they had more bizarre ideas than George. I remember one, this one woman came up to George and she says, and she was pregnant. Why she, and her idea was for her to be ripped open and take the fetus out. I mean, George didn't even go for that one. Never lost his temper, never lost patience, always open to new ideas. Never any yelling or screaming or hollering and none of that stuff. 
it was all, all right, let's make a movie, man. Okay, let's do it. <laughs> I don't know anybody that didn't like him. He was always smiling, always, you know, he was never really, he had no ego. Yeah, he's a professional filmmaker, director, but it, it always felt like you were engaged. It wasn't like being with a director and feeling like there was this wall the whole time. With George, there were no walls. It was George's birthday and they had cake. I was one of the last days we were at the mall. They were saying, George's birthday's come up. We all chipped in money. We bought him a director's chair. It was just a real nice, very humble thing. He just sort of kind of looked down at the cake. He wasn't one that was lots of bravado or anything, but it was very nice. We were standing right there and singing happy birthday to him when he cut the cake. I think everyone got cake. One night we're standing together and George is, you know, looking at the script. And that's why I kind of tap him on the Hey, George, I don't mean to bother you, but like, I'd really like to do a zombie. And like, you know, something memorable. I don't know why I said it the way, but I did. He goes, go upstairs and see what they have. Tom Savini came out to demonstrate this new prop that he had made. And it was a big machete and it had a notch cut out of it, like a half moon. I remember thinking, wow, that's so cool. John Amplis was doing the extra casting at that moment. I said, John, what do you have? You know, George said, come up and see what you have. And he had this machete and it had a cut in it. And I was like, oh, that'd be cool. He goes, yeah, I'm supposed to do that tomorrow. I said, oh, well, that's yours. Let me do something else. And he goes, no, no. He said, I've done like so many zombies and bikers and it's cool, really. They're not going to mind. I'm like, okay. So 24 hours later, I'm getting the machete stuck in my head in the mall. And I'm like in my glory. Because it's like, you know, like people say surreal, it was beyond surreal. It was like an unusual moment because I couldn't feel time. I couldn't feel anything except I was doing something. And then when it was over, I was like, did that work? And everyone's, oh yeah, it's great. It's wonderful. It's, I'm like, oh, they, I, wanna, I really don't want them to cut it out. I really wanted to get in there just so I can be a part of the film on the other side, right? People were fighting to get to be, uh, oh, please shoot me or let, them, let me <laughs> eat the guts. <laughs> My moan in the sun was in the boiler room, uh, so there wasn't a lot of sun. I was really fascinated by the way they made the special effects work, because I knew nothing about that. And the way they wired the thing, so when I get shot in the head, the, the wire pulls and blood comes out of my forehead. That was, you know, all new to me. Uh, so that was great fun. They wired me up uh, with blood balloons. I forget what they called them, uh, squibs, I think they're called. And one of my, I had real long hair like this at the time. I put one in here and, and it ran on a wire to a car battery, as I recall. So they started seeing and there's uh, bikers are circling me and they started shooting at me and I'm staggering. And one of them hits me in the chest and I just keep going. Because I guess you can't kill a zombie that way. And then they came around again and shot me in the head. And I fell face first onto the uh, concrete right in, right in front of the India Imports shop. I completely forgot that zombies got shot in the head, that they would die. I thought if they got shot anywhere, they would die. So that was my stupidity because I forgot about that from the first movie. So there's a scene where I'm getting shot. They rigged me up with blood balloons hooked to like little firecrackers with metal behind them. And whenever they touched a the nail board, they caused the charge to explode. When the blank gun went off, so I heard bang. And I started to fall down like I was being shot. And halfway down, the blood balloons exploded. In other words, I was already falling when they exploded, so I screwed up my shot where I got shot. When I got home, I had to soak in a, in a hot tub to get all this blood out of my hair. It was like uh, fake blood is like some kind of plastic, and it just really stayed in there. I was... Savini's blood was water soluble, so you can wipe that out really fast. But the squib, uh, Gary Zeller did the squib work, and that was a mix of like paint and other stuff. Because I had a winter coat, um, and I had squib spray on that, and I had it dry clean twice, and it still didn't come out. I gave it away. I could probably sell it on eBay now because it was like blood from Dawn of the Dead. On top of my head, there was a bit of a buildup. Embedded in the top part was two blood tubes connected to two tubes running down the back of my trousers, down behind the boxes, where Tom and another guy had these hand pumps 
that were full of the blood. The top piece, the little pizza piece on top, because it was literally cut into chunks or slices. And then that was threaded together with monofilament fishing line, clear line. At the right moment, someone off camera yanks that off in a nice straight line and the blood starts pumping. So I get two nice streams of blood flowing out. All I have to do is fall down without actually killing myself. <laughs> Tom Savini was doing a makeup on Tasso where they put intestines inside of a foam rubber um, chest and stomach. And he's putting this stuff in this red slime into this. He's doing it right in the room with the extras. That's where the makeup was. So he's making all this stuff there and everybody's going, oh, you know. <laughs> They went to eat guts and well, what do we do? And we said, well, why don't we put some bread behind it? At least so they have something in their mouth that looked like they actually were eating something, because otherwise it looked kind of phony. They're just kind of putting it to their mouth. I got eaten. I got eaten. And I didn't know quite what to do. I didn't know what my motivation was, like to scream or, or be silent at that time. went into a total shock, so I was silent. It was just a blast. I didn't want it to end. It was fun. We it had a great, great time. There would be an average of, let's say, 100 zombies, people there, and nobody would take off their makeup. So we'd all get in our cars to go wherever, and you would see, pe I, it, you would see people driving with their zombie makeup on, all down through Monroeville. It was hysterical. We all went to breakfast at Eaton Park. Across the street, there was a pancake parlor, and we all walked in with this makeup and, and blood, and I had no clue what was going on. And the place was chattering up a storm, and as soon as we walked in the door with this makeup on, the place got dead silent. And the most ironic thing was not one person stopped to ask us why we were like that. They just paid their check and went on their way. They had the first showing just for the people who had been in the film at the Chatham Theater. It's gone now. I thought, oh, it's an opening. So I got dressed up and I had a dress on. And I walked in and I said, where are the bikers? And they said, oh, they're down there in front. And I said, oh, OK. So I walked down my little high heels. And they were all sitting there. And they were there dressed in their, their colors. And so I said to the one guy, there was a seat further in, I said, uh, excuse me, you mind if I sit with you guys? He goes, it's only for bikers. I said, oh, really? Is that right? I said, well, move your ass over so I can sit with you, okay? He said, Trudy? <laughs> he goes, whoa, you clean up pretty good, honey. Most of the crew was at the premiere, who was in Pittsburgh. So every time somebody from the crew or one of the actors was up on the screen, we're all cheering. <sighs> they went wild. I loved it. I loved it. And was just so inventive. And Darren. I was literally stunned. I took a friend of mine, he really liked it. He says, but don't tell anybody that you worked on this. <laughs> so I was waiting for my part. And I was like, we're three quarters of the way through the movie. I'm like, I'm never gonna see this. It's, it's cut out. My biggest part was just being hit in the face with a pie. I was wondering where all the part, you know, because I was in, involved and seen a lot of stuff that didn't make it into the film. And you wonder about that, but that's that's the nature of the piece. And all of a sudden it was there, I was like, yes. When it opened in New York, I think Richard had some sort of dinner and then we rented a limo, which was a big deal. And we're driving up Broadway, and it was at the Rivoli Theater or something, right off 44th and Broadway, some big theater. And I can remember the car gets in a traffic jam. And, you know, I, I'm looking at what's going on. Anyway, it was a crowd of people, a line of people, like hundreds of people waiting to get into the show. And that was like, oh my God. <laughs> and it was a wild night. People were screaming and yelling and, oh, it was wild. I thought, actually, I thought, we have a huge hit. I went to the Monroeville Theater, which is real close to the mall, and took my friends with me. And I was telling them, hey, I got this cool scene. I, I get shot. I'm all bloody. I fall down. And so we're watching the movie. And it's going on. It's going on. I'm not seeing myself. 
And uh, the next thing I know, the credits are rolling, and I never saw myself in the in the original film. Uh, and I was really I was sinking in my chair, you know, kind of embarrassed. And it turned out later that I was in the extended version or the European version. Someone told me they had seen me in it. Bands of looters are roaming the countryside, sacking or destroying everything they come across. Just maybe five years ago, I got a hold of the DVD collection and I found myself in it. I was thrilled because I've been telling people I was in this movie forever. And they say, yeah, sure you were. I'm amazed that people are still talking about it. These are all of our pictures from Dawn of the Dead. Here's Tom Savini. Here's John, my cousin and my brother-in-law. There's John Amplis. Some zombies, I was asleep here. Here's the Booba brothers. Here's George, this was at the birthday party. This one is Jeannie and she just made me give her a copy of that because she said, I don't have that picture, it's beautiful. And there's George there too, so it was a nice picture. Of course, no one knew at the time that we were, that we were gonna be involved in a project that was that was just gonna make a mark on people. I mean, it blows people's minds. Not that room, not that room! The most intensely shocking motion picture experience for all time. For very little money, for a little bit of creativity, you, you just made this thing that nobody had tried before. And fans, literally all over the world, because we've done appearances at conventions in Germany and in uh, the UK, all over the US. I mean, it's, it's, it's just, um, you don't expect anything that you do to be loved this much. All these years later, it's interesting to see what it became of how many people, especially younger people, um, still enjoy it and still really love it and still get a kick out of it and come to all the cons and stuff like that. And they're very interested. If you go to a convention where there's a lot of folks from Dawn of the Dead, particularly, it's like a family reunion. I actually did a couple of these conventions and I couldn't believe the people. Somebody said, oh, I want your autograph and put on their zomb biker chick. I said, pardon me, biker chick? There must have been a scene that I rode on the back of a bike. I don't even remember doing it. But that, they, they study every single thing. It's incredible. Sharon has been doing conventions as the nurse zombie for years now. Hare Krishna zombie has made a career of being the Hare Krishna zombie. He had a better career than I did. He was really nice. We talked to him a couple of times while we were waiting. And again at the Living Dead Weekend. And the Living Dead Weekend. <laughs> People from all over the world were there, which is amazing and shocking. Mike Christopher and you in a band, right? Okay. Mike Christopher, you played the Hare Krishna zombie. They, that's why they had shaved heads, you know? So, so I made Mike the Hare Krishna, because he looks like one, you know? I got my banner and my table and my pictures. And these three women walk up, and this young girl in her 20s, she says to her mother, hey, mom, isn't that the movie that Uncle Killer was in? I thought, holy shit, his family calls him Killer. I'm John Kiss, I was the prize. There was this one woman, she must have played seven zombies. We have to know all the details about what happened because the fans are so meticulous. Thank you all for your patience as we go through the process. When you were shooting, was there anything you thought they wouldn't leave in the movie? Like, they're not going to leave this in the movie. Actually, everything we did is in that movie. Okay, there's Scotty, you're looking at him. Stand up into the plates. It's a pump it, pump it. Really squeeze it. Bend forward, bend forward. Bend forward.
without the fans, who would even know Jim Crutt? And the fans feel like they know us. And they are the dearest people. I've made a lot of friends. I mean, I can't believe how it's opened up the world to me. You could do Shakespeare in the Park. You could be in this movie or that movie. But to be in this movie, you have more fans than you ever could imagine. Thank you so much. In Dawn of the Dead, I did a couple voiceover lines that, you know, was a goof. Uh, hello, shoppers. You know, some, something of a ball voice. Attention all shoppers. If you have a sweet tooth, we have a special treat for you. Do you know that people knew all those lines? We like ran to the front row. It's mind-blowing. It's actually a mind-blowing thing to, to see that how much people love these movies. A lot of young people, too. I've been truly amazed over the years how it's sustained itself and has never really lost an audience and kept building an audience. You'd have no clue that it would last that long. People today that, that are fans of the movie weren't born or were just very young when the movie was made. I'm just amazed at the people, second and third generation of kids that their parents have weaned them on, Dawn of the Dead. There's no way you can by yourself determine whether you put a lot of money into it, advertising, talent, whatever, that something is going to succeed or take off or become an iconic film like Dawn of the Dead has become. That is entirely up to the fans and to them we're eternally grateful. We were shooting a, a major motion picture and it was the first film I ever worked on. I didn't know that you couldn't just make this stuff up. You couldn't just come up with your ideas and go to the director and say, hey, heck, we could do this. Imagine doing that today. Those people were lifelong friends and it was a happy time. I'm so glad to have had the experience and we did it. And it was such an intense, fun time. You don't realize how fleeting that was. I actually thought, I think, that it would go on like that forever.